Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Trust that your week has started well, going well so far? Okay, that's great. Uh, let's pray and then we will uh, get into our study for today. I want to request somebody from the batch here to lead us. So whoever has the mic, can you quickly pray? Are we praying? Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Your name is mercy, Lord. We are going to the Lord for your God. Father, we thank you, Lord. Whatever we learn from your God. We learn according to your word. We, Holy Spirit, help each one of us. Each one of us, thank you, Father. All glory, all honor, I give you a name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so we've been learning about um, uh, intercession. And we said that intercession is to pray for somebody. So today we will learn about a deeper kind of intercession. So intercession itself can be of various kinds. So the deeper kind of intercession is what we call as travail. So today we will learn about travailing in prayer. So what does travailing mean? We'll try to understand this term. So usually, uh, uh, and I just want us to be mentally prepared, you know, travailing is intense. It's not the normal prayer which you and I pray for others. It's getting to a deep place where not just in our mind and in our, in our emotions, but spiritually in a strong way we are praying for someone. This word travail is associated with giving birth. So when whenever there's a lady, you know, they're giving birth. So what generally tends to happen is that in the natural process of birthing, very close to the delivery, the, the pain is intense. So you find that, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, travailing that a woman would go through where, you know, she's in intense agony. But her agony is actually connected to the birth of the child. So very soon, the child will be born. But the woman goes through a travail. Okay, so she may be screaming out or she's in distress, uh, but that's associated with the birth of the child. Now, when we think about us spiritually praying for others, we may come to an intense place of praying where we are agonizing in the spirit, where we are intensely pray, uh, praying in the spirit in such a way that it re literally resembles the kind of intensity that a woman goes through when she is giving birth. So this is travail. We'll try and explain it further as we talk about it. So it's beyond the basic level of praying for someone. You know, we might just pray like, God bless this person, heal this person, provide for this person. That's our usual level of praying. But travail is when we are, um, you know, it, we can't, words can't express the depth that we sense while praying about that matter, while, uh, you know, in going before God regarding that matter. So it can happen for various situations where someone's feeling intensely. You know, I remember one brother was sharing when, um, uh, his family, they were going through a very tough time. And in those, in that particular season, whenever he used to pray, uh, he would pray for some time and he would just not get the words. After some time, the words are over and you're still not able to express the, the pain or the burden in the heart. So he would pray in tongues. Sometimes uh, even in tongues, the words won't be there. So, you know, just sighs or groans, waiting in the presence of God and just seeking the Lord, right? Like literally crying before the Lord, deep 
uh, in the spirit. So that was his experience where, you know, he did that and he saw how God delivered him. There was a breakthrough in his family. So deep, intense manner of prayer, which will birth the promises of God upon people's lives. So this is about, uh, you know, normal matters, day-to-day uh, -day matters that you and I go through. But as we study in the course of uh, this book, we will come to a place where we will talk about men and women of God who are prayer warriors. So there is the example of a man called Daniel Nash. We'll talk more about him later, but briefly. So Daniel Nash was the prayer warrior or supporter in prayer for Charles Finney. So those of us who know, Charles Finney was an evangelist. And um, uh, in his crusades, people would, would come rushing, like literally they would run to come and give their lives to Christ. So it was a powerful move of God under the ministry of Charles Finney. But there was a, if you may call it a secret to the demonstration of God's power in Finney's ministry. And that was the prayer of Daniel Nash and his team. So there was an intercessory group that supported the ministry of Charles Finney. So what would they do? They would gather together uh, uh, and Finney would move from place to place. So Nash and his team, before Finney goes to that place, they'll go there like two months prior or three months prior. They'll find a rental accommodation. They'll go to that house and their only job is pray. 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 Day. Night. Pray. Pray hard. And uh, it is said that the people who have observed you know, this group, national group staying in the home, they've, they've, uh, you know, they've shared their experience regarding this team that they would always hear you know, crying coming out from that house noises of crying or noises of uh, groaning, right? And apparently there were days when the steam will not even eat. So the neighbors have noticed no food is going in, no, you know, nothing is coming out. The doors are shut three days, five days. But you can hear people crying, groaning, you know, uh, inside, like what exactly is happening. So Daniel Nash is known for his intense manner of prayer. So he would pray, you know, just, just pray for that city, pray for the, uh, the spirit of God to impact that city, for people to be convicted of their sin. So very powerful team of prayer they were. And they prayed so much that whenever Finney would go up on stage, you could see the results. There was a powerful move of God. People will just hear his words and come running to commit their lives to Christ. So he's a good example. Daniel Nash is a very good example of travailing in prayer. But it is also said that when Daniel Nash died, so he died and uh, Charles Finney tried to continue his ministry, but he noticed that the work of God was not as powerful once Daniel was not there. Because there was no prayer team anymore or that kind of an intense committed prayer team anymore. Okay, uh, But this is the experience of uh, Charles Finney and uh, Daniel Nash. And we can learn a lot about uh, the prayer of travail from the life of Daniel Nash. So now we're not saying that you know without an intercessory team, uh, we cannot have good ministry. No, it worked out this way for... You know, Finney back in those days. But there is a truth in this that whenever we engage in an intense level of prayer and there are certain matters that require that kind of praying, we will see the results. You know, it's like the woman travails and there is the birthing of the child. Unless she travails, the child will not be born. So there is a need for God's people to travail in prayer. And you and I may find ourselves in that place for, you know, various reasons, especially when we are serving the Lord in ministry. You know, we are travailing for the people. We're travailing for the work of God to be done among the people, among the city, the nations. So it's an intense level of prayer.
prayer. So we'll read a little bit more about travail. In the life of Jesus, this word travail is used. Um, it is used in John chapter 11 verses in the passage 33 to 43 where he raises up Lazarus from the tomb. Now Jesus wept. Right? In other places it says travail. Like what kind of what kind of um, crying out was that? We don't know exactly in terms of his expression. Like how did he travail? We have no idea. But it was intense. Whatever he was experiencing was intense. And then he goes ahead, you know, he prays and Lazarus comes out. There is a resurrection after Jesus' prayer to the Father. And Jesus seems to have experienced this travail in many other places. So the Garden of Gethsemane is another place where Jesus prayed intensely. What kind of intense prayer was it? It was so intense that he didn't sleep. Uh, he was physically affected. Okay, we know he was sweating blood. So uh, he really prayed hard uh, in the circumstance that he was in. But Jesus also experienced travail. Now, what are all the prayers he prayed under travail? Uh, we, can, we can assume that one was him going to the cross, but at the same time for people to know the work that he's doing and accept the work of redemption. So Jesus also experienced travail. Let's read Hebrews chapter 5 verses 7 to 10. So one of us can please pick it up and read it through. Hebrews 5 in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up, up prayers and supplications with, with loud cries and tears to him who, who was able to save him from death. And he was hard because of his uh, reference. Although he was a son, learn uh, uh, obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designed by god a high priest of a, after the order of melchizedek all right so as uh, we look at this passage verse 7 it says who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. So vehement cries and tears, that's the understanding where uh, Jesus is intensely seeking the Father. It's also connected with, with uh, agonizing in the spirit. Right? So that's the manner in which he is seeking after the Father. Now, we also know in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. But when he helps us in our weaknesses, uh, this, this passage says that with sighs and groans, you know, sighs and groans, I don't know what you call it in uh, your, like maybe Hindi language or any other language that uh, you understand but it's it's as if you know we we are making these sounds without words but it's expressing the intensity of our cry to the lord so even sometimes the holy spirit gives us sighs and groans even that is tongues actually sighs and groans are also tongues i remember one uncle at church, we have Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, so uh, when it was announced, their family had newly come to the Lord. So they came for Holy Spirit baptism. And this was my first experience of hearing somebody groan uh, and uh, cry. Because usually I've seen when we pray for people, they're filled with the Spirit and they start speaking in tongues. Okay, at least uh, like small little syllables of tongues come. 
but this was unusual we started praying for this uncle and uh, he is like weeping like a baby it was weird because he is this big man and he's crying like a baby okay and we're looking at him and we're thinking what's happening we prayed for the baptism in the holy spirit but then i was reminded uh, romans uh, romans 8 26 27 sometimes the manifestation of the the uh, praying in the spirit is in sighs and groans so he was like crying and uh, sighing and all of that so the holy spirit also enables us to travel before the lord now why why should we we have no idea but the holy spirit knows so if there is a need for us to travel he gives us the grace to travel to cry to intensely seek the lord so that we can have a breakthrough so it's a good thing actually it's a good thing if we uh, are led to travel now we can travel for our own life purposes in our own lives if we are going through certain matters where uh, you know it it is as if the holy spirit is saying i want you to pray intensely so we can pray for our own life issues or we can pray for others their needs uh, maybe something like sickness or maybe somebody who's gone away from the lord it's very painful sometimes to see the kind of life that they are leading uh, and you know we want to pray intensely for them or other matters such as uh, things relating to the city or the nation or people coming uh, to christ so these kind of matters are uh, what we are going to travel about and whenever we travel we can expect that god will release so before the birth comes the traveling so when we travel there is got to be a birthing so that's how the travel works so if it is a travel led by god there is going to be a birthing of the purposes of god let's look at what apostle paul says galatians 4 verse 19 one of us please uh, turn and read it my little children for whom i am again in the anguish of child childbirth until christ is formed in you so paul says i am in what could you just read again i i am again in anguish of childbirth until christ is formed in you okay anguish of childbirth how is paul related to childbirth i am in the anguish of childbirth nkjv version says i labor in birth like a mother but who is paul paul is a minister of god what's the connection anguish of childbirth i labor in birth in the natural you know we give birth to a human being but in the spiritual it takes travailing in the spirit to give birth to the the purposes of god there are certain purposes of god which will never be birthed unless you and i travail unless we labor in birth that's what paul is talking about even paul is understanding i will pray persistent prayer but this is an intense prayer where he is laboring in childbirth so even you and i there will be times when god will call us to pray like this so that we can give birth to the promises of god but if we don't travel we will not birth the purposes of god so that's how it works so there's going to be some situations and circumstances where we must travel even when it comes to elijah remember in persistent prayer we said that god gave him a word and he knew that it's going to rain and yet what did he do he prayed he prayed seven times praying seven times it's persistent 
but at the same time it's intense right because seven times and i told us last time that we don't know how long each of the prayer sessions lasted what if it lasted two days each time he prayed what if it lasted two days he went into an intensity of prayer seven times so it's almost like giving birth like you're dedicated to the cause unless i anguish in the spirit unless i battle it out in the spirit this is not going to happen so i have to pray and i need to go into the depth of whatever it's going to look like for me to give birth right so that's how paul prayed for the sake of the ministry that's how elijah prayed even for the manifestation of the prophetic word prophetic word is given why should we pray about it but you see that elijah prayed so even we there are many words spoken over our lives and over our family but we have to pray the prophetic word and sometimes even intensely right now let's look at a uh, scripture john 7 verse 38 he who believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water okay so he who believes in me out of his heart a uh, which translation are you using do you know nkjv okay that's good so let's just quickly look at kjv Okay KJV says he that believeth on me as the scripture hath said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water belly heart and in fact we can easily replace that term belly with womb okay so womb is the place where the seed is conceived and nurtured and eventually you birth the child out of the womb and jesus said that we who believe out of our belly right out of our belly will flow rivers of living water now we can also look at it in another way belly or the womb so we as the church the praying church it's also as if we are that belly or we are that womb that delivers the purposes of god okay so how does it happen how do we as a church deliver the purposes of god when we are engaged in prayer when we are a praying people that's why we say you know the church in the city has to pray the church uh, in um, uh, the community has to pray so unless there is prayer nothing will take place in our second year uh, we have a course on revivals revivals visitations moves of god how did powerful moves of god take place on the earth you know you have moves such as the azusa street revival 1905 uh, and you can trace it back to um many people who prayed of course uh, there was a gentleman by the name of william j seymour his picture is right there at the back william seymour who was a man of prayer and he dedicated nearly 7 hours every day that was his dedication to god he said god i am going to pray for 7 hours he used to pray every day 7 hours and he gathered together with others who wanted to pray right and they all started praying when they started praying the revival of azusa street broke out and you can read so much about the revival you know about the supernatural miracles how the holy spirit was poured out people were filled with the holy spirit how did it start out of the belly out of the womb of the church praying church 
we birth the promises of god no prayer no travail no birth but travail prayer birth amen so there are many such movements of prayer it's only because people prayed we will again read about uh, john hyde uh, this is a man who prayed you know nearly a, a century ago sialkot punjab he prayed and when he prayed a revival broke out he was not even from india john hyde man of prayer he's called as praying hyde how did he pray day and night he prayed whole night he prayed that was his life testimony that he wouldn't even sleep he would pray 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 but when he prayed like that what happened the revival broke out so out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water that talks about the flow of the holy spirit through the life of each believer but it is also connected to a prayer life a powerful prayer life an intense prayer life when we travel we birth when we pray we birth the purposes of god so that is why it is important to get to that place of prayer you know i can keep talking about many examples of travel because there are many examples of travel in scripture it's because people travel you know the welsh revival um uh, evan roberts okay so that's evan roberts you have pictures of people so you can just take time to to study about them mighty men of god evan roberts he was a bible college student he went back home on holiday but god convicted him during a prayer service or uh, you know like a church service he heard somebody preach a message uh, which called to consecrate oneself and he decided that he's going to pray that prayer of consecration he started and some of his friends also started praying with him and then he dedicated many hours praying 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 and one of the uh, uh, revivals that impacted society is the welsh revival you read about many transformations that took place through the welsh revival but how did it start prayer intense prayer this man dedicated himself evan roberts he said you know what i'm going to pray many hours of prayer and something amazing happened in that region of wales okay and they say that it impacted other places like in the northeast of india you have some you know like uh, um people who were affected by the welsh revival who came and who planted churches many things have happened in the world but how did all these things happen we can easily trace it back to people of prayer men of prayer women of prayer not just you know jesus bless me give me a good day amen more than that dedication to prayer depth in prayer right so we are comparing it with travel when we travel we give birth if we don't travel there is no way to give birth so we are the church is the womb of god if the church will not pray nothing will happen that's as uh, we look at prayer if we don't travel we can't keep saying god why are you not doing why are you not doing this why is there still you know crime in my city lord why why are who's praying god is saying yeah i'll do everything but who's praying so as the womb of god unless we position ourselves in seeking the lord like that with intensity we cannot expect any move of god god is good he still does his miracles but it's all you know just a little bit like a taste but if we want more then we have to position ourselves in intense prayer or travel okay so are you all understanding what is travel yeah okay great so this is what travel is all about and um, as intercessors we must commit ourselves to praying intensely uh, yes is there a question anyone online i thought i heard someone all right okay so let's move on now a little bit more about uh, travelling though we've said that travelling is like 
crying out to God, right? Groans and sighs. We must not always connect it to the level of sound. You know, sometimes what happens? We scream and shout when we pray. But it need not be a travail. It can be very noisy, our prayer, but it may not actually be spiritually intense. So the level of noise does not determine the intensity of prayer. Sometimes we are not loud. Sometimes we are not, uh, we are not um, noisy. And yet we may be praying the most intense prayers. So we can't judge you know, any prayer of travail by the loudness or how much we are crying. That's, that's not what determines the intensity of prayer. Somebody could be very quietly praying. Somebody could be, um, you know, very, you, you look at their face, no expressions. But they may be travailing. At the same time, somebody can be very, you know, animated, dramatic, loud. But maybe they are not in that place of intense praying. So we should not confuse loudness and action with travail. Travail can even happen very quietly, right? But it's more about what's happening in the spirit as compared to what's happening uh, in the environment outside. So that is another point regarding travail. Now, when we talk about travail, we said earlier that the Holy Spirit helps us. Sometimes we don't have the words to pray, but He with sighs and groans helps us to pray. Okay. Now we also said that travail is connected to birth. Holy Spirit involved in prayer uh, is like an agent being involved in birthing. Why are we saying that? If we go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. What does it say? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Somebody? In yes. the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Mm -hmm. The earth was without form uh -huh. and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of the God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay. So... In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Earth was without form, void, darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering upon the waters. Other versions say moving, moved upon the face of the waters. Now this term hovering, if we look at the original word, right? Hovering. Hovering means brooding over. Brooding over. So in, in case of like a, a hen, a bird, it broods over. It broods over the, the eggs. So then what happens? Yes, so it provides the necessary warmth and uh, that leads to birthing. The Holy Spirit hovering upon the waters is actually a reproductive term. So when the earth was formless, nothing was there. And it starts off also by saying God created. So from nothing, when God is creating, Yes, God spoke, but the Holy Spirit was the birthing agent at the time of creation. He was brooding over the waters. That means he's getting ready to create something. He's getting ready to, if you want to call it, give life. So when we engage with the Holy Spirit in our prayer, what is the activity of the Holy Spirit? Reproduction, giving life. He comes in, he joins the prayer, and he's the birthing agent of God. 
okay so when the holy spirit is part of our prayer you and i can expect the birthing of the purposes of god in and through our lives it's really powerful if the holy spirit was there at the time of creation brooding over the waters to create today when we engage the holy spirit we allow the holy spirit to participate in our praying he will create there'll be nothing but something is being created as we are praying what is being created whatever is in the heart of god the will of god isn't it that's what the holy spirit leads us to pray according to his will we don't know what to pray so he leads us to pray according to his will and he helps us to birth the things according to his will in our lives so that's the reason you and i must engage the holy spirit or say holy spirit come help me i'm praying and we will give birth to the purposes and the promises of god so this is the way for us to um engage in intense prayer and uh, for us to pray as the lord leads us and release his purposes okay and involve the holy spirit who is the birthing agent so let me just uh, pause over here and check if you know everyone's doing fine if you're getting what we are discussing here about and if there are any thoughts or discussions there's more in the chapter but i'll go in some time uh, anything you want to discuss before that let me know Okay so in that case we will just move on so we've understood Mama, yes i have a question here yes shri raj yeah but i'm not able to get it uh, uh is mm. that uh, mm. because we've been continuously praying right we uh, uh have a focus on prayer also but we haven't been summoning we already have a holy spirit when we get baptized right uh can you come again please i i didn't quite hear what you said see uh when we get baptized mm -hmm. uh, uh god has given us the holy spirit yes yeah so it helps us and it guides us according to the god's plan mm. yeah but the, the deviation part is that a lot of times we get confused and we don't uh go through the plans and we make our own decisions why is that <laughs> why is that um i guess god has given us free will so even though we know what is good for us we don't we don't take it so i suppose that that is why we make bad choices um no i'm i'm not clear because huh. we try to go according to the scriptures uh, as per what god wants us mm so we read it every day we understand it we analyze it mm -hmm. and uh, but where is the lacking part we are still uh, unable to understand the holy spirit or unable to understand the scriptures okay fine so uh, you're saying that every believer when we are born again we already have the holy spirit in us right and yes. the holy spirit is guiding and leading us so you're asking about this additional aspect of the holy spirit helping us yes that why is why right. we need it yes okay uh why do we need it i don't know if i can answer that question but i can say this much that it was jesus who placed emphasis on it um, uh shiraj because okay we learn in acts 18 when jesus said and you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in jerusalem judea samaria and to the ends of the earth and so in acts 1 you'll also see jesus telling them so wait in jerusalem tarry in jerusalem don't do anything 
before you receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now, why did Jesus do that? The disciples, we could say uh, in uh, John 20, there is a time when Jesus comes and he breathes on the disciples. He breathes on them and says, you know, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. So that point in John 20 is considered as the point when the disciples were born again. Before that, they were not born again, right? Because Jesus had not died. But Jesus died, was resurrected. When he met the disciples, he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. So they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So technically, whatever you're saying, Sri Raj, we have the Holy Spirit when we are born again and Holy Spirit is guiding us. So the yeah. disciples are born again. Now, why is Jesus telling them again? when they have the Holy Spirit, that you need the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And then we see whatever happened in the book of Acts, that you know they were filled with the Spirit, they were praying in another uh, tongue. So God thought it necessary for the people okay. to have this empowering. Okay. That's what I see. So while the Holy Spirit has a ministry of leading and directing the believer. There is an additional ministry of the Holy Spirit that comes upon the believer when the believer receives the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Both are required. Amen. Yeah. Okay. So, does that so make sense? Yeah. What, what I'm trying to say? Yeah, that be the sense, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Any other questions? I can see Philip uh, is saying, okay, some explanation about groaning. <laughs> I can't possibly make the groaning sounds to explain it, but um, let me see what are all the other words. Okay. So here it says, a moan, a whine, a sigh, a howl, a sob, a cry. So these are all the connected terms that can explain groaning. Okay. And it's again, as I told Philip, it's not about the sound. It's about the intensity of the spirit. So sometimes uh, it may or may not have a sound associated with it. But, you know, we find ourselves in places where we are like literally crying out to the Lord. Uh, and that is what is important. And that is only travail. I hope that uh, explains. Okay. Philip is fine with that. He's good with it. Any other clarifications? All right. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll take a break now. We think about whatever we have discussed. And uh, let's come back after the break. And then we will uh, study a little bit more about travail and move on to the next chapter. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.